Hello everyone, welcome to the conference on delivering for nutrition in India, insights from implementation research. My name is Rebika and I'm from IFPRI. The plenary session on what is the role of food supplements in large scale nutrition programs, the state of the evidence will be chaired by Purnima Menon. Purnima Menon is a senior research fellow in the poverty health and nutrition division at the International Food Policy Research Institute. She is the team leader for South Asia Nutrition Program in IFPRI. In her work in India, she directs Potion, an initiative to support more use of evidence for nutrition in India. She conducts implementation research on scaling up maternal and child nutrition interventions, including on evaluating large-scale behavior change communication programs in nutrition and health. Thank you all for taking part in the conference, and we look forward to an engaging and interactive session today. Before the chair takes the conversation forward, I have a few technical announcements to ensure our experience is as smooth and interactive as possible. The session will be recorded and posted on the IFPRI Potion website. You can find all information about the conference and other useful resources on the portion.ifpri.info. All participants have been muted, but later in the session, we will open the conversation. If you have questions, we invite you to share them in the Q&A box throughout the session, and we'll do our best to raise them during the Q&A session. If there is time, we have participants to raise their virtual hands so that we can call on you to speak your questions aloud. In case a similar question to yours is already there in the Q&A box, please upload it to avoid repetition. If at any point you experience technical issues, please check your audio settings and your internet connection. You can always try to reconnect to the session using the same Zoom link and the passcode. If you are in Twitter, please use the hashtag deliver for nutrition. Thank you and over to you, Purnima. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca, for uh, opening up the session today. Uh, well, friends, we are on day two of the Delivering for Nutrition conference, uh, which, as you know, is co-hosted by 19 co-hosts in India um, and focuses on, on really examining um, a range of evidence that pertains to uh, supporting the um, national nutrition mission and associated actions for nutrition across India. One of the key features of the conference this year is uh, the three plenary lectures. Um, it was wonderful to see so many of you online yesterday at the plenary lecture with Professor Margaret Crook on quality health systems and what they mean for nutrition. And it's a real privilege uh, today for us to have a session on something that's really important uh, to, the, um, uh, to the programs, to nutrition programs in India. And, and that is the, an update on the evidence on food supplements um, in terms of their impact on nutrition outcomes for women and children, but also on where they sit in the context of India's nutrition programs. Uh, what we have today is, is really a, a feast of evidence in this, in this next hour. Uh, and I'm really pri privileged to have uh, with us uh, Professor Zofikar Bhutta from uh, Sick Kids and the University of Toronto as our uh, speaker on the global technical evidence, and Dr. Rajan Shankar and Sharika Yunus um, um, as national experts um, on where uh, food supplements sit in the context of India's nutrition programs. Um, the way that we will run the session today is that first Professor Bhutta will share uh, insights from the evidence review that he and his team have been doing. Um, and I'm also pleased that we have with us um, online Emily Keats and Zora Lassi, who are um, on the team of people who've been supporting this, um, you know, this massive enterprise of synthesizing evidence for uh, the global technical communities. Um, and then we'll have Dr. Shankar and uh, um, Dr. Sharika present um, an overview of where this sits in the context of India's programs. So without further ado, um, let me, um, introduce and, and invite Professor Bhutta to join us. Um, so if, if we could have you with your camera or, or if you can share your screen, that would be great. Uh, and by, by way of introduction, although I, I don't think Professor Zofika Bhutta needs much introduction to anyone who's in global health or global nutrition, uh, but he is uh, currently the inaugural Robert Harding Chair in Global, health, global Child Health at the Hospital for Sick Kids. Um, and co-directs the Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health. He's also the founding director of the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health at the Aga Khan University. And he holds adjunct professorships in numerous 
leading uh, universities. We're very pleased um, to have this virtual opportunity to have you join us today, um, uh, Zofie. So um, welcome and over to you. You have about uh, 20 minutes for your presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Panima, and, and very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you, colleagues, for firstly, hosting this meeting on such an important topic as the one we are discussing today. Uh, global nutrition uh, is totally dependent upon what progress is made in India, and I'm particularly grateful that I have an opportunity today to share some thoughts with you. I'm also very pleased that uh, from my larger nutrition team that works across many continents that we have Zora Lassi and Emily Keats, who are part of the program today, and I may call upon them to answer some questions. What I would like to do today is to particularly focus on why there is so much interest in food supplements in the context of nutrition for women and children. And that's partly because, as we've highlighted recently in our Global Nutrition Report, there is this notion that food supplements could be a double-edged sword as the world faces the double and triple burden of malnutrition with not only undernutrition that many of us are laser focused on, but also the emerging issues with overweight and obesity across uh, the age continuum of children, adolescents, and women. Uh, and of course, micronutrient deficiencies are ubiquitous across those populations. So how does one begin to address all of that, given the context of varied geographies, various socioeconomic contexts, and also importantly, COVID-19 that we have all faced together. So what I would like to do is to start off by sharing with you as to what evidence am I going to refer to. So there are these two things that our group has done over the years that are largely focused on bringing a summative evidence of what works for nutrition. Firstly, with the first Lancet nutrition series in uh, 2008, then an update in 2013, uh, but both of those literature reviews had some limitations. Uh, they did not parse out the evidence uh, strictly by its origin from low and middle income countries versus high income countries. And there was also uh, the niggling notion that it treated all types of evidence uh, with a broad sweep of a comparable kind of analysis, which has been highlighted also recently by people in terms of doing meta-analyses only on high quality studies. So we've just concluded and we have a, a, an update of this evidence uh, in the Lancet uh, very soon uh, on looking at what has changed in 2020. That's been based on several reviews that are part of a supplement that's been published and I can refer you to those. The two that I'm going to refer to in particular today are looking at dietary interventions in pregnancy uh, and in women of reproductive age in general, and also looking at infant and young child feeding, which will relate to supplementary feeding in an age group where you require complementary foods in addition to breastfeeding. So here's a, a new framework of what kind of nutrition actions are we looking at? And this is part of what will come out in the Lancet. So we're looking at interventions that are both direct and indirect from nutrition sectors. And these include many of the things that we are talking about. But in addition, one needs to remember very clearly that a large proportion, in fact, from our recent work on stunting exemplars, it's very clear that 50 to 60% of all change in stunting in many geographies is directly related to interventions outside of the health sector. So I only highlight this to ensure that you are aware that what we are looking at, particularly in the context of food supplementation here, is a very small fraction of what is needed to move nutrition, but it's an important fraction. And it also relates to delivery platforms and strategies. You've heard about health systems yesterday, but there are also social safety nets and platforms such as schools uh, that are very relevant in this particular context. So what are the strategies that we use to combat undernutrition, particularly in food insecure populations? So uh, clearly uh, diversity of diets and, uh, and, and in terms of young children, appropriate complementary foods after six months of age are the cornerstone. Supplementary feeding for target populations can take several forms and particularly for food insecure households. So generally what we are going to consider in the review today is the evidence around balanced energy protein supplements and, and the new data on lipid nutrient supplements that provide a range of micronutrients with a small amount of energy protein and essential fatty acids. 
Uh, I'm going to say something about food distribution programs, uh, which are there and the evidence from their impact on, on birth outcomes. And then we will say something on what needs to be done for complementary feeding in food insecure populations, where although nutrition counseling is done, it may not be sufficient. So let's start with pregnancy and our review of supplementary feeding in pregnancy, which largely relates to food distribution programs. So here, our review was focused on generally uh, healthy pregnant women in LMICs, and we looked at standard care as a comparison or routine diets as a comparison to what, what was done. And a range of outcomes were looked at. Uh, we were particularly focused on good quality randomized control trials or quasi-experimental studies, but also, uh, included were uh, quasi-experimental designs such as program evaluations and, and uh, intent to treat studies. So from a large set of data that um, uh, were looked at, we identified 13 studies of which eight were focused on balanced energy protein, five on food distribution programs. And I'll start with the latter um, initially. So uh, the balanced energy protein supplementation program generally had a, I mean, surprisingly, a relatively small number of participants. If you look at eight studies, which is the largest lot that we have, it only has about 2,000 participants. So let me make the plug at the very get-go of needing to improve this database with large randomized controlled trials, and some of those are underway at the moment. So this slide summarizes some of the impact estimates, and in bold are those that are significant. So we do see that balanced energy protein supplementation in the right population does lead to a reduction in rates of stillbirths, perinatal mortality, improves birth weight with a mean difference of around 107 grams in pregnancy, and importantly, reductions in low birth weight and small gestational age. Uh, the quality of the studies is generally low, and that relates to both sample size and also uh, uh, the way they were designed. Very few of these, in fact, none are large cluster randomized trials. If you look at the, uh, the forest plots, you will begin to see the paucity of some of that data, even though the direction of effect may be very clear. So these are data on stillbirth reduction, about 60%, uh, the improvements in birth weight that I talked about across a larger set of studies in various geographies, about 100 grams in pregnancy, uh, reduction in low birth weight, 40%, and a smaller proportion in small for gestational age, which is generally the gradient that we see in these kind of studies. Uh, Zora Lassi has looked at all of this data in detail and our overall assessment of the information is, there is good evidence to indicate that, that this works, but we need better evidence from larger studies to inform the effectiveness phase of this program. Uh, when you go to food distribution programs, your number of participants increase, the number of studies diminish, and, and your range of outcomes that we have looked at uh, do show some impact on weight gain in pregnancy. You see a mean difference in birth weight of around 40, 46 grams, and some reductions in outcomes in infancy. But you will notice that we do not see, even though the direction of effect may be correct and in the right uh, way that we would expect, we do not see significant impacts on low birth weight, SGA, or prematurity. And here are some of the forest plots, again, highlighting that we are indeed looking at very flimsy data uh, from relatively small programs. Uh, stunting reduction in children is only based on two studies, one of them done by Per Eshwan in Africa. And, and here, although their effect is consistent, the, the studies are largely weighted by this large trial run by Merida et al. Wasting, a similar effect in the right direction as, as stunting. Uh, so food supplementation programs, I think considerable potential, and particularly when they have balanced ingredients. So one would make the case going forward is to say in food insecure populations, particularly where you have wasted women, giving supplements which are balanced and maybe dependent upon local ingredients might be the way to go. Now, there's been a lot of interest in lipid supplements, um, partly because like uh, ready-to-use therapeutic foods, there is consistency in, in, in composition, and, and there is interest in terms of large-scale distribution without the variability that you get if you're looking at a range of ingredients. And here, we have from a large number of uh, hits, principally four good quality studies, uh, uh, which have had altogether about 40 papers 
that were part of this particular review. There's a Cochrane review on this uh, and behind it run by Jay Dallas. And here, if you look at the impact, and I'm gonna look at this in two ways. One is lipid supplements compared with standard of care. And here the standard of care in pregnancy would be iron folic acid. So how does this compare with iron folic acid? So the important thing here is that there do seem to be benefits in comparison with the current standard, both in terms of linear growth and pregnancy. I mean, difference about a quarter centimeter, you can argue, is that enough or not? Uh, in 50 grams birth weight gradient and about 6% reduction in small to gestational age births. But importantly, you see a benefit in terms of reduction in stunting in the two studies that followed kids till six months of age. And those benefits are uh, obviously important in a public health context to have an 18% reduction in stunting within the first six months, something that is a very important gap in global evidence on what can be done for malnourished children in that age. And quickly, if you look at the forest plots here, you will see that there is pretty much consistent impact on birth weight, reduction in small to gestational age, heavily weighted by the Merida study um, and stunting, again, in the right direction. Uh, and overall, therefore, it looks like in comparison to iron folic acid, LNS has some advantage. What about multiple micronutrients? Because iron folic acid are just two nutrients and lipid supplements have multiple micronutrients. So what about the gold standard? let's say multiple micronutrient Unimap like uh, products, what would be the comparison in outcomes? And here we looked at uh, a range of outcomes that you see over here, and we do not see any convincing impact of NLS being superior to multiple micronutrients in these back-to-back -back comparisons, even though the direction of effects for a few things like low birth weight in SGA uh, may be in the right direction. And it just makes you wonder how much of the impact of LNS is actually due to the micronutrients within them, and do they overall they offer an advantage over multiple micronutrient supplements? I'll quickly show you the forest plots just to give you the lay of the land, and you can see the low birth weight effects, birth weight uh, trends, uh, pre prematurity, which you know people have spoken about in multiple micronutrients. Uh, again, weighted by one large study from Bangladesh, and here you do not see an impact on prematurity rates and uh, a small and non-significant effect on SGA. Let's now pivot to children. What needs to be done for children? And here, uh, the food and related interventions that we're going to look at are largely divisible into two. One is supplementary feeding, which is basically food distribution programs to food insecure households. Um, uh, I am not going to speak about moderate to severe malnutrition because the data and evidence on that is pretty mixed. Uh, we are going to speak about complementary feeding in a minute. And here, the outcomes that we were looking at are both morbidity, mortality, and growth. And fortunately, we have enough randomized controlled trials to base our evaluation on good quality studies. Let's start with supplementary feeding. There are actually 40 studies that come into this, and 28 of those relate to complementary feeding, and 12 are supplementary feeding programs. So, so not minuscule, about uh, altogether uh, close to around 4,000 records were evaluated. So the important thing here, and, and Zora Lassi has looked at this consistently over the last decade, uh, um, based on, on evidence reviews at different time points, is what happens in food secure and food insecure settings. And it's very clear that the benefits that you accrue from providing complementary foods along with education, which is the uh, ethical law, is, is generally in food insecure settings. And here you see an impact on linear growth and about a 30 some percent reduction in stunting in the seven studies that follow these 8,000 children uh, appropriately. And that's a very important finding because if you have populations at risk of malnutrition and insecurity, and you only go and provide education, you're not going to get that impact. And, and, and the so-called food secure settings are where there was adequate diet available at home. But when you don't have that available, you really have to provide some kind of food or, or incentives or money to be able to purchase that food. And you see this very clearly in the forest plots here. You will notice that the confidence intervals are wide and, and that in general, we do not see an effect on, on just weight as such, but we see an effect on linear growth. So the height of age Z score increments in food insecure populations 
are, are, are quite significant, it's about 0.14 gain in this. Um, you do not see wasting effect, which is also not altogether surprising. And, uh, and you do see an effect on stunting and, and by this intervention, as I have just highlighted. I want to turn on to supplementary feeding, which is basically provision of available diets or foods which are based on locals, local ingredients or staples. There's a lot of interest in this, but there's a lot of diversity in the data. And in general, uh, there is not a high quality study within this that we review. They would range from either low to very low. Uh, the one study of uh, one um, uh, grade evaluation uh, of an outcome of looking at wasting using this particular uh, um, uh, lens uh, does show a significant effect on reduction in basic weight for high Z scores. And you see this very clearly highlighted with the forest plots here that show the effect as non-significant on just weight alone, on height alone, and on the weight for height Z scores, you see some gain, which is, um, I think I would take it any time if it was at scale. But I would point out to you that a large proportion of this evidence is from just a limited set of studies and authors. Uh, we are interested in stunting as being an outcome from this, and I can say with confidence that from the data available so far, there is no impact of food distribution on stunting by and large. What about uh, our newly found friend, lipid nutrient supplements in children? These studies have looked at a range of settings in Africa, Asia, in our neighborhood, 17 studies, 50 plus papers. And we were very curious again to look at this evidence. And this review, um, Cochrane review was led by Jay Das and my program. Here, we do see impact, which is of great interest. So you see an effect on stunting, reduction, both moderate and severe, and, and these are between seven and 15% reduction. The quality overall of the, of the grading in this evidence is moderate. Uh, there is an effect on wasting, and there's an effect on underweight. And you see this very clearly in, in the distribution pattern of the forest plots in, in here, that there is a general consistency of effect on severe stunting, on moderate stunting, you know, just a few studies pulling it over, uh, on severe wasting, we don't see an effect, but we do see an effect on moderate wasting. Uh, and that's also plausible, just, just given the composition of these nutrient supplements. So let me finish by saying that although the data on this are diverse, and they come from across the range of LMICs, uh, there are some generalizations that we can make from the global evidence over the last 20 years, looking at this since, as I mentioned, the 2006 evidence syntheses. Uh, we believe that balanced energy protein a, a supplementation is appropriate for undernourished women, and particularly in food insecure populations where there's a supply issue, you either give, give quality food, which is balanced, uh, or you give balanced energy protein supplements. And, and just blanket uh, inadequate food distribution program does not cut it. Um, this should be tailored to provide an appropriate amount of energy and protein and micronutrient supplements in these particular households. And the jury is out as to whether a combination of just available food and multiple micronutrient supplements would be sufficient, just given the evidence that we have on these being differentially beneficial. Uh, when it comes to children, uh, if you are food secure, if you have enough food, then appropriate education to families and parents uh, is adequate and health providers. But when there is no food, when people are food insecure or dirt poor, then just providing education is not only unethical in the view of many public health professionals, but it needs to be complemented with the right kind of food supplements, which can either be supplied or, or provided as raw ingredients or as pre-prepared foods. And these are important because that's where you get the benefits in terms of, of the growth. We believe that the evidence in support of a small quantity lipid supplements in, in at-risk children is strong from what I just told you. And in contrast uh, to other uh, interventions, the benefits that we see are both in terms of micronutrient status and improvements in growth. And that's certainly worthy of larger evaluations in, in um, adequately um, powered uh, effectiveness trials. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll be very happy to take questions as will be my colleagues when it's appropriate.
Wonderful, wonderful, Sophie. I that was just an absolutely amazing talk, and and you know I I have uh, been sort of watching WhatsApp groups light up uh, on the nutrition community in India, saying join this talk, join this talk now. So I'm really <laughs> glad we are recording and uh, live streaming on Facebook, so more people can join this, um, and we know folks will will listen in later as well. Uh, but I think you set us up phenomenally well for. Um, the presentation that Dr. Shankar and, and Sharika will now do because, you know, what you've done is remind us that the efficacy evidence for these interventions is strong. Um, and, and indeed that the integration of these types of uh, food supplements um, is really important in the context of programs in countries like India, where we know that we have large um, populations of, of food insecure, uh, both you know, both mothers and, and babies sort of living in food insecure households. Um, so, you know, I think this is uh, really setting us up uh, super well. So I'm really pleased to, to now um, invite uh, Dr. Shankar and Sharika to, to share with us, I guess, an evolution and current state of uh, the inclusion of uh, food supplements in India's nutrition programs. Um, let me say a couple of words about them first. Uh, Dr. Rajan Shankar is a founding director of the India Nutrition Initiative, which is an initiative of, of the Tata Trust. Um, the Tata Trust, of course, are one of India's big uh, philanthropic organizations uh, dedicated to, to nutrition. And previously, Dr. Shankar was the regional representative for Asia at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. He is a physician. Uh, he is phenomenally dedicated uh, to this issue of improving uh, the lives of young women and children. And I'm so pleased, Dr. Shankar, that we have you with us today. And uh, his uh, co-presenter, Dr. Shankar and Sharika are co-presenters here. Sharika is the head of a unit and a program officer for health and nutrition in the UN uh, World Food Program in India. Again, uh, I've known Sharika as well for many years and, and she and her team bring incredible dedication to improving the quality of what's happening in India's food program. So uh, let us hand it over to you, uh, Dr. Shankar and Sharika to, to take us on. Uh, you have about 15 minutes as well. And um, there are questions already coming in on the, on the chat box. So let me also remind everyone that is a place, uh, sorry, not the chat box, Q&A box. That is a place for you to um, share your questions. Thanks and over to, to the two of you. Thank you, Punima. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Professor Bhutta, for that uh, wonderful uh, talk where you know we couldn't have asked for a better summary. But I start with a little trepidation because uh, uh, but at the same time, I'm a little emboldened with your summary, saying that, uh, you know, we'll come to that later. Um, you see, <clears throat> India at any given time has about 50 million children uh, who are below two years. The sad reality is close to about 40% of them move out of this cohort with some form of growth faltering. Many of them move out stunted uh, with the negative consequences for the rest of their uh, life. India has one of the biggest community nutrition programs in ICDS. And it has a program, a subset of it, that is a supplementary nutrition program that we believe offers an opportunity to improve nutrition in the critical window of the first thousand days. Dr. Sharika and I will present in the next few minutes why we believe focusing on the take-home ration component, what has come to be known as take-home ration, it's a food supplement that women take home and use it over a period of time, could really help improve complementary feeding and thus help decrease the growth faltering seen in the children. Now, India has a long history of supplementary food programs. It started in the early 60s, and then there were multiple uh, programs at different times, different way. But common to all these programs was, all these were started at a time when the world was focusing so much on the protein gap. And then came 
the but you know it was thought that protein deficiency as a major cause of malnutrition in children and then the protein energy malnutrition was the focus therefore many of these programs i would say all these programs had just one thing in common they were just trying to fill the protein gap or the you know the purported protein gap and fill the energy gap when in 1975 the icds started in a small way they didn't make any correction to this uh, understanding even though in 1974 um, mclaren had published in uh, lancet about the protein fiasco it continued with the same formulation in icds now today icds is a universal program in india it has an amazing reach it's a match reach it has 1.38 million centers across the country uh, as of 2018 the supplementary food reached 70 million children and 17 million pregnant and lactating uh, mothers so it has really the potential and the right platform uh, that is unmatched by anything else next slide yeah one before please so this just to show you the indian children start with a great disadvantage at 6 months you find there are 20% of these kids are stunted and then it steadily increases and peaks between 18 and 24 months and then it more or less stays at that wasting is even more highly prevalent if you look at nearly 32% of children are wasted at 6 months and it slowly decreases but as high as 18% of children are wasted at 5 years of age this shows that a lot of it is antenatal for this growth faltering they start with a disadvantage but a significant portion of this growth faltering is occurring during the first 2 years and we could do something at this phase of the complementary feeding to correct this next that's why we said why focus on the take home ration portion of it because we know that the rate of growth i mean the velocity of growth of fully breastfed infants in developing countries is comparable to infants from developed kind of developing countries uh, to developed countries like say india the children the velocity of growth if they are fully breastfed is comparable to anywhere else but infants in developing countries often deviate from this growth uh, this is mainly because probably because they lack nutrient dense complementary food and of course the other factor is frequent infections uh, that uh, result in this growth faltering next next sharika next slide um it's yeah so, yeah so we if we are to use the food supplement that is being given to children and pregnant women through the icds system the first thing is that whatever we do we need to uh, a strict adherence to the guiding principles of complementary feeding is important and we have to do that but then if we have to make this food supplement an ideal uh, complementary food supplement then a number of things need to be attended to basically with the energy what energy it provides versus what is required the nutrient density the micronutrient composition ration size and feeding frequency i think uh, sharika will take us through all that and then we'll uh, i'll come back and say how we believe that we can tweak this program to really uh, improve complementary feeding in children in india thank you over to you sharika um thanks a lot dr sankar um, in the next couple of slides uh, we'll talk about the uh, take home rations in india uh, but before we go into that what i have here is a slide which compares the recommended dietary allowances for energy and protein across the complementary feeding age group 
Um, then it compares it as to what uh, energy needs to be provided uh, from the complementary foods to children who are breastfed, or to children who are not breastfed, and then how does it compare with the ICDS energy and protein norms. Um, so what you could see here is that very early on when complementary feeding is being started, uh, what the ICDS provides is much more than what is the recommended uh, energy allowance as far as um, children who are breastfed are concerned. Um, and what we also understood from Dr. Sankar's presentation was that the complementary foods need to be diverse. It needs to come from a whole range of uh, different food commodities. So it's not as if one particular food which is provided through the ICDS, which may either be a blended food or a fortified food, needs to complete uh, the energy gap that needs to come from the complementary foods. Uh, similarly, when uh, we compare or we look at what are the micronutrient requirements from the complementary foods, and this is data from the World Health Organization, uh, what we see here again is that across the age groups, if we were to compare it with the guidelines which were issued by the Ministry of Women and Child Development in 2009, then the micronutrient content of the foods that we're providing through the ICDS do not compare very favorably. Um, the ICDS says to provide 50% uh, of the recommended dietary allowances for various micronutrients. And 50% uh, when the guidelines were issued, we still had the earlier RDAs into play, which were issued in the 1980s. Uh, 2010, we had the new RDAs, and most of the states have gone on and uh, uh, sort of aligned the management of the foods that they're providing to the new RDAs, but a comparison of the new RDAs at 50% would basically mean only about 4.5 grams, milligrams of iron, about 200 micrograms of vitamin A, and about 300 milligrams of calcium, which is much less than what we see here and as recommended by the World Health Organization. Uh, what we understand as the global guidance on what complementary food supplements for children between 6 to 23 months of age should be, uh, it basically talks about giving one serve size per day. Product should provide about 100 to 150 kilocalorie. Um, it has specifications for protein and fat content. It talks heavily of the quality of protein and that's the quality of protein should uh, be met by milk because uh, milk, as has been proven, uh, has impact on stunting levels as well. It also talks about anti-nutrients and it talks about the need to have products fortified uh, for such young kids. And of course, whatever is given needs to comply with the International Code of Marketing of the Breast Milk Substitutes and the subsequent World Health Assembly resolutions. Um, now, uh, in the next three, four slides, um, is uh, is the work that the World Food Program did um, in late 2018, 2019, where we mapped the different products which are distributed as take-home rations across the country. Um, of course, after that, there's been a bit of reconfiguration in a couple of states. Uh, so you may not necessarily uh, see products available for Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir separately, uh, but uh, it gives a big bird's eye view of what are the sort of products which are distributed. Uh, so if we try and categorize the products that are distributed as take-home rations, it falls into three large categories. Uh, there are products which are ready to cook, there are products distributed which are ready to eat, and some states provide dry rations of rice or wheat and pulses. Um, a couple of states, um, especially when we did the study, so Jammu and Kashmir, as well as West Bengal also provided hot cooked meals. If you look at the composition of the take home rations, it's uh, more than 50% or let's say close to 50% have wheat as the most commonly used cereal. Uh, most of the products use multiple pulses. Uh, the products to a very large extent use sugar and um, the idea behind sugar is that there's a certain caloric norm that needs to be filled and therefore sugar is a cheap option for filling that caloric norm. Uh, the products also use oil heavily, uh, but in about 26 of the products there was neither use of oil nor ghee. Um, and ghee is the local term which is used for um, clarified fats in India. Uh, the products do not have milk powder added to it 
and we do have products or at least half of the products which are given do have micronutrients added to it so meaning to say that they are fortified um, if we look at the take home rations and here on i'll specifically limit myself to products which are distributed to ch children between 6 to 36 months of age as that is the age group which receives a take home ration in india um, and what we have here is that the global guidance says that the energy contribution from sugar should be less uh, than 10%, but about 27 of the 41 products that are distributed provide more than 10% energy contribution from sugar. In fact, the average energy contribution from sugar is close to 23%. Uh, the products also do not do well as far as energy contribution from fats are concerned. And then they go on and do slightly better when we talk about energy contribution from proteins. So 41 of the 33 products provide uh, about 10 to 15 percent energy contribution coming in from proteins. Um, the, the way the take home rations are produced in India, there are two primary, primary models. One is the centralized model, where in the contract of uh, producing the take home ration, as well as distributing it right up to the Anganwadi is given either to a public sector enterprise or to a private sector enterprise. And uh, examples of states which follow that model is, is given here as well. Then we have the decentralized model because there's been a Supreme Court's order uh, where, wherein they talked about reducing the role of the middlemen in the distribution of the take home rations. And in the decentralized model, it's often women's self help groups who've been given the responsibility of making the take home rations. Uh, the level of decentralization varies. In states like Rajasthan, it is extremely decentralized with one self-help group providing or uh, catering to about one Anganwadi centers and to a max of five Anganwadi centers. Uh, but in states like Kerala, it is decentralized, but at a slightly higher level, where in one take-home ration production unit, which provides one block or one project or a sizable number of Anganwadis. Uh, just a slide to show how these models are implemented in different parts of the country and to also note that gradually states are shifting around the different models. Uh, so we know that the government of Uttar Pradesh would now want to move from a centralized model to a decentralized model. Um, and as agencies, um, and there are a couple of us such as IFPRI, the Tata Trust, the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, UNICEF, uh, we do not have any preference for the model as such, whether it's centralized or decentralized. We do believe that both the models with the right conditions can be made to deliver a good product to young children as well as to pregnant lactating women. Um, just a couple of words on quality control and quality assurance of these products. And we know since these products are given to young children, how important it is to uh, talk about quality control and quality assurance. Uh, but while we were undertaking this study, what we found was that it was very difficult to try and get any information on what are the QA, QC mechanisms that different states follow uh, for the production of take-home rations. Um, however, uh, we were able to get some information from about 10 states. And in these 10 states, we were able to note that the states usually have a quality monitoring committee in place. The sort of parameters that are assessed on the product are energy and protein content, micronutrient content, uh, microbiological parameters like yeast, mold, E. coli, um, and of course, moisture and ash. But what we also found was that uh, there may, in some states, be a third party mechanism for lifting of samples of take home rations from where they're produced. Oftentimes, there's no frequency defined to the level or to the periodicity at which these take home rations need to be lifted for analysis. If at all they get lifted, then there is no um, uh, feed, uh, there is no time uh, agreed in which the report needs to be submitted. Oftentimes, the reports on the product come once the product has already been consumed by the beneficiaries. And lastly, if there is a variation which is noted between what's been specified by the state and what actually the product is delivering, there are not many states who go on and take punitive action. Um, just a couple of slides, and just to say that these slides have been picked up from presentations made by Purnima on take-home rations and the work done by uh, Purnima and the team. 
uh, why we believe that the take home ration or the ICDS is a good platform to leverage is because ever since the ICDS has been universalized, there's been an expansion in the reach of the ICDS as well as the services which are provided through the ICDS. Um, so uh, the, the number of respondents who uh, are using supplementary nutrition or supplementary foods which are provided through the ICDS has increased from about 10% to now almost close to 38% uh, for when this data was collected. So therefore, uh, there is a huge scope to leverage the integrated child development services scheme and to use it to push an appropriate product for young children as well as uh, for pregnant lactating women. Um, however, what we do not know about the ICDS take home ration is uh, that once it reaches the homes or the families of young kids and pregnant lactating women, how is it shared within the families? Is it actually given to the beneficiary for which it's meant to be given? Um, and how well has it led to improvement in infant and young child feeding practices? So issues around that are slightly unclear and that's, that's an entire research agenda um, that different agencies are looking at working on in India. Uh, with that, I pass it back to Dr. Sankar. Dr. Shankar, just a request to, to be yeah. very, very brief because we have sure. many questions in the Q&A okay. for just Richard. Just move on to the to next Sophie. slide. Yeah. Uh, move on to the next slide. Hello. Uh, Move on to the next slide. Yes, I'm, I am. Yeah. Yeah, the next, go to the, we, uh, all this. Yeah, now, see, from what Sharika presented and what we heard, um, you know, from the beginning, we know that ICDS with its uh, unmatched reach, and as uh, Purnima said in the introduction, a significant proportion of this ICDS budget probably close to the equivalent of $2 billion go towards this food component. Now our idea is how do we use this to drive impact? Uh, one of the slides that uh, Sharika showed, Purnima has been, their team has been working and they call this food uh, supplement, food distribution program as the gateway program in ICDS. I mean, it draws uh, people to come and they also benefit from getting the other services. So how do we use this to really improve delivery of other services? And the most important, if we want to use this to drive impact, we need to change how it is being done. Now, we repeatedly heard that, you know, the balanced energy, protein energy um, uh, supplements. It is not what was devised in the early 60s and 70s that we continue with. We know very clearly from science what is an age-appropriate complementary food and with a little tweaking we can do. Otherwise, in its current form, it is just going as a, a food distribution program. It gets in like the last slide that showed into the family part and we can't expect much of an impact. So we believe that we need to align the formulation with global recommendation for complementary food. It is possible and it can easily be done. We need different formulation for children and pregnant and lactating women. This whole program gives about 100 to 120 grams of cereal. Professor Dr. Shankar. started with saying, yeah, okay. So well, I think uh, we'll, we'll move on to the question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so sorry to cut you off. Uh, no, no, there no, are, no. I've seen about 10 questions in the Q&A box. Uh, that are directed to Dr. Butta's presentation. So I, sure. I, and I, he has to leave us at the top of the hour. Uh, sorry, at uh, 6.30, but um, we've agreed that the rest of us will be able to stay on for another 10, 15 minutes to continue the conversation that's mm -hmm. more pertinent to India. Um, so Zulfi, let me ask you uh, maybe three or four questions that are clustered uh, together um, that pertain primarily to the evidence reviews. Um, so the first is, uh, so uh, there's a two or three questions that are coming from uh, Vani Sethi at UNICEF who manages um, a lot of their uh, program support work on maternal nutrition. So Vani's questions are as, are as follows. One is, have you looked at uh, overweight or obesity as an outcome in the context of some of these evidence reviews? Because many of these 
supplementary food products, whether in the Indian program or in the ones that have been tested globally, are high in sugar and carbohydrates. Um, the second is a question from Sam Scott, a research fellow at IFPRI, asking whether the duration of the interventions was considered in, in, the, um, in the context of the evidence reviews. Do you find that some studies may actually have been too brief for the outcomes of, of interest, given that they take some time? Um, uh, do you have, uh, there's a question from Shruti Bhatt who says, you know, do you have a, sort of any, any idea of why the LNS was probably showing better, better results? Um, than, than the multiple micronutrients. Um, there's a question from Shuti. I'm just going to ask these out here and we can come back <laughs> if you forget some of those. Yeah. Um, so, 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 Bhairam, if I may. Yeah, if yeah. I, why, I, why don't you I take may, those three uh, and then we'll uh, come back. Uh, I may have to leave uh, at the top of the hour for this other meeting that I'm chairing. Uh, but, you know, my team's on online and I hope Emily and Sora can uh, maybe take some questions. There are phenomenal questions on the chat that I've seen, <laughs> and, uh, and I'd be very happy to answer them by email or whatever. If you can forward those, I'll give a more considered response than I may be able to do now. So the first thing is, of course, many of these studies are principally efficacy trials, and they are generally, therefore, subject to the same fallacy as many trials are. They're not in the appropriate populations. They're not real life versus you know, uh, artificial settings. It's the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. So there's a question on why don't we have many effectiveness trials is because we just haven't done them. And, we, and there isn't the support at times for doing large effectiveness trials, which all take a lot of money, time, uh, and they need to be done, particularly for balanced energy protein. I've been on a crusade for the last 20 years to say, uh, following that decision study in the Gambia by Andrew Prentice and team, if you look at the quality of balanced energy protein studies, it's just ridiculously small, uh, uh, non-representative populations, and not the distribution programs that government programs can emulate. So I would very strongly support the notion that we need better evidence, more evidence, and that can only happen with the right design. Now, overweight. Very few of these studies have followed people for too long. Uh, they generally have been, there's a question on duration of follow-up, six months to one year, by and large. Uh, few have followed them across time spans. So, for example, you look at multiple micronutrient supplements, there have been studies which have followed them up for five to 10 years. In contrast, for food supplementation programs, that's not been the case. And one of the big questions behind so-called uh, food distribution systems and um, perverse effects in terms of growth of overweight and obesity is exactly this, that we need to couple this with, with uh, appropriate duration of follow-up and population level monitoring. That's not to say that supplements are the only cause. Uh, if you look at oh, oh, the major drivers of obesity, particularly in transitional economies and overweight, it's a combination of poor diets which are available in the neighborhood in the food environment and, and also uh, physical uh, mobility. And uh, some of those dynamics are maybe more important than just exactly what you give them. Coming back to, uh, to uh, Anushanka's point, I entirely agree that we do need uh, a better mix of diets out there in public sector programs. And ICDS is not the only one. Uh, you know, I, I evaluated the major program in Sri Lanka on complementary foods that had mm. a food product that is given to women and children called Triposha. It's been there for the last 40 years, if not longer. Nobody's ever evaluated this content. And basically these unbalanced kind of food supplements are feel good supplements that you give out, but they are neither qualitatively nor quantitatively sufficient. So that needs to be done. The question on LNS, uh, Purnima, is a great question. And I wish I could give you a scientific answer based on composition, fatty acids, profiles, metabolomics. Uh, the, the, there are theories, but we don't quite know what, why LNS performs much better than other types of micronutrients. We do know that there is a logical basis as to why they are better than micronutrient powders, because you know micronutrient powders have never been shown to have an impact on growth. Uh, the only time they've been shown to have an impact on growth is when they had a formulation that was adjusted to low birth weight populations, work done by Stan Slotkin in, in Bangladesh. But in general, they have not been able to show any impact on growth, maybe some impact on anemia. 
So, so I think LNS has to be evaluated against uh, standards of care, which uh, in children in particular, which have to balance out dietary intakes in both populations and trials that have looked at those, both in Bangladesh, Africa, Kenya in particular, have generally not had that level of metabolic detail in the subject population to allow us to parse out why they perform better. But they are being rolled out now, and there's great opportunity for that kind of research. We've just published some stuff on, on um, um, uh, fatty acids in severely malnourished children receiving uh, um, uh, ready-to-use therapeutic foods. So that kind of studies can be done, and they are very instrumental in learning why these children are different. Oh. Great, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question, uh, and then we'll we'll say thank you to you and let you go. Um, so, and uh, this is another question from Vani um, uh, Sethi from UNICEF asking about the, she calls them wet feeding, but these are really cooked meal supplementary yeah. nutrition yeah. programs, which, you know, in many states, they've done quite a bit of work to actually make them balanced on both energy and, and protein. Um, including a variety of foods, et cetera. So is, you know, what's your take on that? And, um, you know, any, so, any, any yeah, other I, studies I mean, from yeah, other contexts? <laughs> so, so one is a great question. And I actually, you know, I don't quite know why they're called wet feeding. I mean, you have to go back. Uh, I mean, it's a concept that's been there since the early 90s. They're basically large scale food distribution programs. Uh, and it's a term that was, picked up from, I, I believe, the veterinary literature where it was used to describe just blanket feeding for, for um, um, animals, and particularly pigs. So um, my view on wet feeding, or let's say large-scale food distribution programs is that it's a, it's a blunderbuss gunshot therapy for things that may have more consequences than benefits. Now, I can understand that in the time of crisis. So you have a famine, you have populations that are displaced, you have large scale malnourished, mal malnourished women and children. It makes sense to therefore not screen in that emergency situation and just provide food to people. But when you're looking at stable populations and you look at distribution patterns that we currently have in South Asia, and India is no different from Pakistan, Afghanistan, elsewhere, is, is that you have the, the ultra poor, the people who really are food insecure and need it, living right in the midst of people who actually don't need food supplements, for whom the risk factors are very different. Now you go in there and you provide a food distribution program, uh, particularly if it's that of staples and what used to be the favorite of many of these agencies that is giving oil and sugar, uh, the first people in the line will be those who don't need it. And, and you have therefore those perverse consequences of those programs. So I would say the more granular we can get in terms of identifying populations and pockets at risk uh, and geospatial patterning monitoring allows you to do that. Uh, you can therefore have large scale food distribution programs to those who need it most, but increasingly, increasingly with uh, precision public health, we are coming to situations where we know where we need to go. Uh, immunizations are a remarkable example as to how strategies for reaching those who are unvaccinated, poorly vaccinated, are increasingly honing in on those populations at risk. So I see absolutely no reason why we should not target nutrition programs with the same level of granular information at population level. I'm not talking about household level only. I'm talking about pockets of population yeah. where you may go with supplementation programs as opposed to other things. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Well, you know, th there are uh, obviously many, many more questions. And, you know, I, I hope uh, in this virtual world, maybe this is not the uh, only time you, you can visit us. But let me, um, you know, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, you so much for and, and as I said, agreeing. Emily and Zora are there. Yes, yes, thank you. So if there are more, there were a couple of other specific questions that related to the review, so we'll ask them. But we'll let you uh, let you move on, and we'll share the recordings with your you and your Stay team. Stay safe, well, and have fun, and invite me again. I would love yes, to love absolutely. to uh, interact. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. So now, Dr. Shankar and, and Sharika, there are um, a set of some really important questions for for both of you um, as well. So let me um, try and ask you ask you that. Um, one is this question of, you know, do you, do you have data? So in what you've compiled, um, you know, do we have any data that, um, um, 
you know, balance energy protein during pregnancy is, is working, but more importantly, where it has been tried in, you know, in the compendium that you've built or in the databases that you've built. The second, um, a second set of questions is, you know, sort of a more um, general take on food supplementation in the ICDS and, you know, what should we conclude in terms of um, successes or, or failures thereof. And that's a question from Dr. Kapil Yadav. And then I'm going to also ask a question um, to, this is again a question, Vani, you're asking a lot of questions, but that's great. Um, to Dr. Shankar, uh, how will the estimated, uh, the, the EARs, the estimated average uh, requirements um, being formulated to replace the RDA have implications on how we look at the nutritional composition of the take-home ration. So why don't you take those first three questions and you know, then we can come back to maybe a couple more. Um, I'm gonna ask you know, audience to continue to stay on. It's great to see more than almost 150 people, 130 people here. Uh, we can stay for another 10, 15 minutes to continue this very important conversation. Dr. Shankar, Sharika, either of you, those questions. Yeah, Sharika, I'll, I'll just uh, go first and you can uh, please feel free to supplement. Um, you see, on the first question on do we have data on the balanced energy protein supplement and how it works in pregnancy or in children, we don't have our own data. I have not uh, gathered. But there is global evidence available on why that works. Many of that started with you know the high protein uh, supplements and the negative uh, effects that resulted in the neonatal period in children. And that is how it moved to the balanced protein uh, supplementation, but I have not reviewed that. I won't say, and we don't have anything from our own ICDS that I know. On the food supplementation ICDS, what are the success and failures? We try to only present that this program from the beginning has worked more like what uh, Professor Buta presented as one of those food distribution programs. You know, it, it's not been positioned as an ideal supplement to fill the gap of uh, what is missing in the diet of the people. Except that when this is devised in the beginning, it is assumed that there is a, a, an average energy gap of about 300 uh, kilocalories. And then it was assumed that there was a protein uh, gap and they tried to fill these two. And it has just been continuing on that. And as I mentioned, that it does not even differentiate what should be a supplement for pregnant and lactating uh, women and uh, children? It is the same formulation, except that a higher quantity is given for uh, women. So it is assumed that it just gets into the family part and it, it helps with, if they are food insecure, it helps. So therefore, the, it's more a failure in terms of it making a direct impact as an ideal supplement to a poor family diet. It is just replacing a poor family diet with a poor formulation. So I would think so far, the way it is done, it is uh, just more to uh, you know, fill the calorie gap. On the estimated, you know, yeah, we want to move away from the RDA. We recently had this. It's, we don't have enough information on this. The only time that we have got some kind of information on, um, you, you know, the micronutrient uh, deficiencies and levels is when we had the CNNS survey and that result. Now, to estimate what is the estimated average intake and what proportion of the population are really at risk, and we moved to a big food fortification program through both the uh, public funded food programs as well as the commercial channel and then want to fortify ideally all the supplements that we want to provide, it is better that we uh, estimate at least in key target population, children below two years, pregnant and lactating mothers, what is the average uh, requirement today and not go by the, uh, the RDA and then see uh, be mindful of the risks of multiple uh, food vehicles being fortified. It is more 
to avoid that risk. However small it is, the risk is real unless we use AEAR to adjust that. Does that answer? I mean, uh, you can add uh, Sharika. Sharika, would you like to add? I uh, know I would just say that uh, Colonel Shankar's covered it for both of us, so no additions for me. All right. Thank okay. You. Um, let's let's see. There are still a, a few other uh, questions here that we should take a look at. Um, I have um, Sam. I'm imagining your question on food supplements in in adolescents. Um, was perhaps related to those who've been doing the evidence review. So I'm just gonna ask uh, perhaps uh, Zora, um, I don't know if Zora is still on online, because um, I know both Emily and Doc, uh, Dr. Bhutta had to leave. All right, looks like they're not here, but I, I think this issue of food supplements for adolescents, um, particularly in the context of school feeding programs, perhaps also needs to be looked at. You know, again, the midday meal program has also been very focused on you know, closing energy and sort of food, sort of a food security uh, oriented approach uh, to look at uh, whether there's more we can do there on nutrition. Um, uh, what about, uh, I, Kapan, uh, you're asking, it, it's a very important question, you know, what is uh, our take on food supplementation in the context of ICDS and, and the five decades of existence. So if you don't mind, maybe I'll take a first crack at just, you know, putting my perspectives out there and then also would hear from, from Dr. Shankar. Um, firstly, I, I think we, um, we sort of underestimate in a sense the, um, well, we, we sort of over criticize the ICDS for its failures when we say the program has been in existence for the last 40 years, because I, I think it's really important to look at the the scale and the reach and the depth of the program and how that has evolved in the last 40, year, 40 years. Uh, the ICDS has certainly not been nationwide in the last 40 years. It's really only moved to a nationwide program, um, I would say in the last decade, even in terms of policy uh, design. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Right to Food Act and then the responses of states to that act uh, are really what took the program nationwide in a sense, in, in, even in terms of intent. It was much more targeted and, and much more sort of in, in pockets before that. I think it's also really on, only over the last decade that there's been, a, a, or maybe decade and a half, that there's been sort of this deep design, uh, deep thinking around design elements of the program and its, and its intended goals. Um, my take based on the evidence that Dr. Bhutta presented uh, to us today is that there are likely very few populations across, um, I think especially the poorer parts of India where most of the malnutrition sits, that some additional food security or you know, nutritional supplementation support is not needed. And so you know, I would say that the, the nutritional supplementation role of the you know, of India's nutrition efforts, be they in the ICDS, the MDM, or the PDS, or wherever else, uh, remain critical because there are very large um, sort of populations, not just individuals, but populations who need that additional support to be able to respond to the behavior change communications and all of that. I think we could do a much better job of integrating, a much better job of moving the program from being a food distribution or a food supplementation program to one that is an integrated nutrition program. Um, so, so I would put the, you know, the success and failures more in the context of what more can we do? I, you know, as a nutritionist, as a public health professional, as a researcher who studied many of these programs, I am certainly not feeling like we should be dropping the food component of the program anytime soon. I think our research efforts and our programmatic efforts should be to strengthen the food supplementation of the program and make it work better for the populations um, in terms of acceptability, in terms of how it sits with their diets, how it fits with complementary feeding, and in terms of quality so that we can have uh, more impact of those. Uh, so Dr. Shankar Sharika, maybe if you could share your thoughts on that and, and we could make those sort of your maybe wrap up comments, you know, it's, it's a much broader overall yeah. uh, set of um, Thank questions there. Thanks, uh, Ponima. I think you covered it very well. But I would, um, in the light of what 
Dr. Professor Bhutta presented today, and also in his um, you know, remarks, he very clearly mentioned about you know, the world moving towards what we called as the precision public health. And he also cautioned that when you go about distributing food in the general population uh, across, then it is those who may not need it are the ones who use it most. So these are the dangers that we should be aware of. I'm not saying that we should drop it. We are not mindful of these. And fundamentally, we have to change what we are giving. You cannot, unless it is targeted in targeted geographies to the most vulnerable population with an appropriate food, appropriate for the age, appropriate for the physiological group that we are targeting, and have some measures to really see whether uh, it, it goes with all the other uh, necessary things, like what you called as an integrated program. Just providing this, as uh, Dr. Butta clearly mentioned, also the drivers of growth faltering or the malnutrition are wide and well outside of just the food. I think I, I would just stop there saying that we should be mindful, but uh, the continuing this program in the same way is an enormous uh, drain on our expenditure, which could be far more wisely used to reach those who need it most. It is not required in many of the places where it is being done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shankar. Sharika, your thoughts? And perhaps if you could also reflect, Sharika, very briefly on what might some implementation research needs be. Sure. And then we'll um, wrap thanks. up. So on the implementation research uh, piece, uh, I think some of the gaps which are emerging and which we're not too much sure of, because there's hardly been any research in this area, is once a product is given to the child, how is it consumed within the family? Um, and we did talk a bit about that in the presentation, uh, because what we know uh, from, uh, I mean, not from well-researched study, but from word of mouth, is that the product is actually distributed and consumed by everyone in the family. So it goes into the family pot. It's not necessarily targeted to the child. Uh, the other thing that perhaps could uh, emerge as, as an area of research is um, if you give a well-designed product, which is well-designed uh, from a nutritional perspective, then how much of the mal how does it lead to any improvement in infant and young child feeding practices? And if it leads to improvement in infant and young child feeding practices, primarily complementary feeding, then does it have an impact in terms of preventing malnutrition? Um, so perhaps that that's another area that needs to be uh, looked at in in more detail. Um, and while we are talking about this, there are uh, there are a few states who are waking up to the fact that take-home ration has the potential to do so much more than what we are using it for. And hopefully these states uh, would provide us the opportunity to be able to undertake some of the research pieces and fill the existing research gaps. Um, I would agree with uh, both Dr. Sankar as well as uh, Purnima that uh, it's not just about giving anything to the community uh, because they're poor or there's a food system in place and something needs to be distributed. It should be about giving them a good product which will help uh, meet some of, um, some of the things that we need to undertake from a nutrition perspective. Uh, gone were the times when there was just something that needed to be distributed and tummies need to be filled. Now perhaps this can be leveraged because it has that much reach and made into something much better than what exists. And when we say quality, it's not just about the nutritional quality of the product, but quality needs to come in all perspectives or all dimensions of the take-home ration quality in terms of packaging, because that helps the community understand that it's a good product which is being given to them. Um, it's a product which is of a certain level of value. Quality in terms of how the product is produced, how the product is tested. Uh, so take-home ration just doesn't stop with the product. There are many dimensions to it. Uh, with that, I'd stop. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharika. So I'm going to officially uh, close the session now, again, with uh, huge thank yous uh, to the two of you also for having joined. I, I think the format we had here of sharing 
the global evidence and then linking it to the complexity of what happens in in India's programs is, um, you know, has worked really well. I learned a lot. Um, and, you know, I can see from the Q&A sessions uh, that people have posted here that they also have valued and appreciated this session. Um, again, um, there is still a lot to be done in terms of reaching every woman, every child who wants and needs it um, with nutritional supplements in the context of the ICDS program in particular that work for them, that are high quality, that are respectful. The food is a form of respect as well, and the food that we put into our programs is a form of respect for our populations. And so, so, so to have food that is respectful with dignity um, and that is of the kind of quality that uh, really is accepted by, by everyone who receives it, and of course is nutritionally adequate and has an impact, these should be our aspirations for the inclusion of nutritional supplements in the ICDS. And I do hope that together with all of you in the room, all of you listening, uh, and with the policy community, we can do the research that needs to be done to deliver those products. But more importantly, that that research can help to deliver a program that should deliver benefits and impact for um, all women and all children across India. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Shankar, Sharika, and thank you very much to everybody who joined us today. What an important topic and what a fantastic discussion this was. Thank you.